thank you all for joining us for tonight's um, monthly webinars. This will be the August edition of the Master Beef webinar series. And tonight we're going to cover a timely topic, um, something we've been getting a lot of calls about recently uh, from both agents and producers, and that's nitrates, uh, nitrates in forages and feeds. And we've been getting calls from the nutrition perspective, forage management, um, and even maybe some health calls. And so because of that, um, myself and Dr. Gary Bates and Dr. Lou Strickland are going to tag team tonight's webinar um, and hope that we can open it up to some pretty interactive question and answer here in just a little bit. So I'm going to kick us off with just some overview about nitrates uh, and some concerns that we look at. Um, and then again, we'll open it up and hopefully have some, some good discussion here. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and, and get started. First, I just want to talk about nitrates and feed in general. So when we think about nitrates, we typically think about them as a, something that's a problem, um, you know, when they're at certain levels. But nitrates do occur naturally in the diet, and they're only an issue once they get to a certain level. And so when nitrates are in the feed or in forage that cattle are consuming or any livestock, um, specifically in, in ruminant animals, those microbes in the rumen can use nitrogen to make protein. So it would be similar to the way that they can utilize non-protein nitrogen. Uh, they can break down that nitrogen and that eventually becomes a protein source. And so under normal conditions, just in a typical feedstuff, nitrate is ingested by cattle uh, it's, it's reduced to nitrite, and then that nitrite is, is made into ammonia, and eventually that becomes amino acids or bacterial protein. So a protein source for cattle that's not a direct um, protein that's in the feed itself. And so typically this is, is what happens, but when we start seeing pretty high levels of nitrates in feeds and forages, they start to become... Um, so high that the rumen can't break down that nitrate uh, into nitrite or ammonia as quickly. And so basically the system becomes overwhelmed. It gets too much nitrate and it's not able to break down that nitrate fast enough to convert it to ammonia. And so the nitrates start to accumulate in the rumen and eventually those are absorbed into the bloodstream. Um, so this is again where we see high levels becoming a problem. And when that high level um, is exposed in the bloodstream. So when those nitrites accumulate in the, in the bloodstream, they bind with hemoglobin. And that means that the blood is no longer able to transport oxygen. So the cause of death, when we see really high levels of nitrates and we see um, cattle that die from this, the cause of death is actually asphyxiation. They're not getting enough oxygen um, that's passing through their bloodstream because of these high levels of nitrite and those chemical reactions that I just talked about. So this time of year specifically, we're thinking about um, certainly those warm season annual forages. Um, Johnson grass, you know, is a, a weed in a lot of our pastures. We have a lot of it and it can be problematic with nitrates. Other warm season annuals that maybe we've planted or that just occur in our, our fescue pastures. Um, specifically thinking about crabgrass, and then of course those sorghum, sorghum sudan, things like that. Those are the, the plants we think about this time of year, um, thinking about those drought conditions that really can be a problem and accumulate nitrates, uh, but certainly other forages can accumulate nitrates as well, and I've got that list here for you. And so under stressful conditions, um, specifically right now, you know, thinking about drought, and we've certainly had some rain here in the Knoxville area, but I know some folks had some drought conditions pretty recently, and that's when we started getting these calls about nitrates. And so um, drought is a condition that can contribute to nitrate accumulation because it's a stress condition on the plant. And so any stress condition, drought, frost, low temperature, et cetera, can become an issue where we see those nitrates accumulate, um, but specifically tonight we're thinking about drought conditions. So depending on um, nitrogen fertilization, if it's been heavily fertilized, there's nitrogen source that was put onto that plant, um, that can also contribute to that nitrate accumulation. And then the, the age of the plant um, and even the part of the plant will determine what the levels are throughout the plant itself. 
So when we see a toxicity, um, some of those symptoms that we might see would be staggered gait, tremors, rapid pulse, or dark mucous membranes. Um, again, I mentioned that the cause of death is asphyxiation. And so if you have a pregnant animal, um, then that fetus may also um, be affected. And so we might, might see an abortion because of that. And I'll mention this a little bit later, but we have to think about nitrates not only in the feed, but also in the water and that total nitrate load that's going into the animal. And so um, certainly I'm gonna defer most of our health questions to Dr. Strickland, but if, if you suspect nitrate poisoning, you would call a vet. And I believe that typically um, we don't necessarily see those symptoms. A lot of times we just see the, the resulting death of that animal and then have to go back and figure out you know, if that was the cause. So that's kind of an overview of the problem that we see with nitrates. Now I wanna talk about forage analyses and just clear up some confusion about some numbers that we see reported um, so that we know when we get an analysis back what we're actually looking at and how to interpret that information. There are a couple different ways that nitrate might be reported on an, an analysis. Um, two of those would be nitrate and nitrate nitrogen. So nitrate is the nitrate ion, and nitrate nitrogen is the nitrogen that is a part of that, that component. And so there's a conversion there, and I, I don't want to get too tied up into you know, this chemistry part or, or the math, but um, the reason that this is important is there's a pretty large difference in levels of nitrate nitrogen versus nitrate. And so when we're looking at an analysis, we need to make sure that we're looking at the correct numbers um, and interpret those in a way that we can make feeding decisions uh, that are appropriate. And so you wanna check the method of expression on your forage analysis. If you've had an analysis completed by the Soil Plant and Pest Center, um, they do report nitrate or the nitrate ion. And so you'll see these numbers ranging much higher here. Um, you know, obviously they can start at zero, but 4,000 up to 15 and even 20,000, rather than those numbers of the nitrate nitrogen, which are, you know, below maybe 5,000. So we do report nitrate. And just keep that in mind when we talk about feeding recommendations here in just a little bit. If you're curious about the samples that have been submitted so far, these are just from 2022. Um, I broke this up into corn, which is most of our corn silage crop, mixed grasses, and then warm season annuals. So what most folks are, are harvesting this time of year. And I've got that threshold there, 2,500 parts per million. That's parts per million of nitrate. And there's a note on our forage analysis um, definitions publication that says, you know, nitrate levels above 2,500 can be toxic to ruminant animals. And so that's often a threshold that we rely on to say, okay, if it's above this, we need to proceed with caution. And if it's below that number, because that in the, the grand scheme is a pretty low threshold, um, then we can go ahead and proceed with feeding that animal safely. So you'll, you'll see that a, a good bit of our warm season annual forages that have been submitted do have higher levels than that 2,500. But the question becomes, okay, at what level can I, you know, still feed this or incorporate it into the diet uh, and not cause a negative effect? So there's, there's kind of two approaches that I would use here. Um, I get the question, you know, what is the number that we need to use and tell folks that this is a safe level to feed? So this first approach is kind of the simple approach, playing it safe, looking at that 2,500 level of nitrate as the threshold, and then wide ranges um, as we look at these numbers. And so I've got a table here, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all of the different parts of it, but you'll see that there's a safe level, so anything below 2,500. And then there's a pretty large range, 2,500 to 5,000. And at that point, we want to proceed with caution. That means that some of our animals are going to be more sensitive than others. So specifically thinking about our pregnant animals, uh, potentially just feeding them, you know, a small amount of this forage, but we don't want to feed them only this forage. 
um, but maybe for some of our other classes of animal, this would be okay. There is a note there that says, um, don't feed it with any non-protein nitrogen or liquid feed. So if you remember when I was talking about those microbes utilizing nitrogen in the rumen, we certainly don't wanna add more of that non-protein nitrogen on top of these nitrates because there's already that issue of not being able to break down this nitrate uh, as, as quickly as it needs to. So then there's a pretty big jump in this table. We go to the orange uh, level of danger. So 5,000 to 15,000 parts per million of nitrate. And that basically tells us we need to limit this to one fourth of the ration. And then as we move up to over 15,000, um, you know, that's gonna be a toxic level. There, you know, there's a very specific way that we can feed that. We certainly don't wanna do it free choice. We wanna limit it pretty closely, uh, but you'll see that this is a, a simpler approach in terms of thresholds and ranges as the one that I'm, I'm about to show next. So this approach is a little bit more flexible. Um, what it does is it gives us some more ranges to work with uh, and some more specific recommendations, but it is what I would consider more risky. Um, so we know that we're working with levels that are greater than that 2,500 threshold. So we know there's a risk associated with feeding that amount or that um, level of nitrate. But what this table does and, and what these recommendations do is give us a little bit more information about how much we can feed in the diet and which animals we can feed it to. So if you're, um, if you're thinking about utilizing a high nitrate forage, maybe you want to hone in and look at that level a little bit more closely uh, and then determine, you know, maybe I'm just going to feed a quarter of the diet or a third of the diet. Um, and make sure that I don't, you know, go outside of those guidelines. So it's a little bit more flexible, gives us the opportunity to utilize forages that may fall within these ranges, um, but certainly knowing that there is a, a risk. And above that 18,000 level, uh, I added that note there at the end, don't feed to any cattle. <laughs> um, certainly I would not want to recommend to anybody that's just feeding their, you know, their cows hay out in the pasture, um, to feed anything that's that high in nitrates. So that's a, a pretty risky situation and, and I wouldn't recommend feeding um, in that, at that level. So again, you can see here lots of different ranges, um, but you know, there's, we just kind of have to assess our level of risk. And we're gonna talk about that uh, here in just a minute, some things that we need to think about. Um, but it's important to remember that nitrates do not dissipate. So they're not going to re be reduced just by putting that forage up for hay. Um, and it's not like prussic acid, which goes away or breaks down after the stressful event. So after a frost, you know, we wait for a certain amount of time before we graze Johnson grass, that prussic acid dissipates, but nitrates are not like that. So over time, these levels cannot be reduced. Um, there is some evidence and we've gotten some questions about whether ensiling will decrease nitrates. And there are some numbers out there that say it might decrease the nitrates by 30 to 50%. That's a pretty big range. Um, and it's not been shown to, to happen every time. And so certainly if you decide to ensile a forage that is high in nitrate, uh, make sure that you go back and test it when you go to feed it out or after it's been ensiled, just to make sure that those levels are, you know, either have potentially dropped or you still are making informed decisions on how much to feed. So the way that we utilize these forages in the diet is we dilute the nitrates out, similar to the way that we would dilute uh, tall fescue with red clover or another forage. Um, we can dilute out these nitrates by adding other feedstuffs into the diet with them. There's been a, a lot of variation in recommendations and maybe even some confusion about, uh, again, how we approach um, what thresholds we need to feed at. Uh, and so the reason that there is variation is because it really depends on whether the animals are adapted to nitrate, meaning they've eaten forages that have had, you know, some level of nitrate and they've eaten them slowly over time, um, and then rate of ingestion. So an animal that goes out and eats a pretty large amount of hay because it's been given hay free choice or it's been given a large bale of hay, um, 
we'll probably see a problem more quickly with that than we would with an animal that's been limit fed. And so we have to think about how we want to approach this and what our level of risk is. Um, so I, like I said, with a level that's pretty high, I'm not going to say, oh, you need to measure out a, you know, a very small amount and limit feed. And, you know, that starts to get a little bit complicated and, and I'm a very risk averse person. Uh, so we have to think about, you know, what am I risking by potentially adding these high nitrate feeds? Can I trust that, you know, my, my nutrition management um, is going to be such that the animals are going to get just a little bit of the high nitrate feed uh, and maybe some of another type of feed. And so thinking back to those recommendations, um, think about the class of animal that you have. So certainly for pregnant animals, we don't want to risk feeding them high nitrates. Thinking about their stage of production. So um, these nitrates can affect obviously pregnant animals, but also milk production. Also think about the feed and water resources that you have available. So do you have other forages maybe that um, are lower in nitrate that you can feed uh, with or, or instead of something that's high in nitrate? Think about your water resources. If it has high nitrate um, and you're trying to offset that amount, then certainly we don't want to add a high nitrate forage on top of that. So we may have to think about, okay, I've got higher nitrates in my water, then I need to use a lower nitrate forage source. Um, so with that, you know, we think about forage analysis, when we think about percentages or parts per million, um, and we can get hung up on some of those numbers, but we also have to think about just total intake. So you may have heard me say before that animals don't eat in percentages, um, they eat in amounts. And so if I tell you that a forage is 12% crude protein, I have to know 12% of what, right? 12% of the whole, but how much are they actually eating? So I can know how many pounds of protein that animal is eating because they have a, an intake requirement in pounds. And so this can get a little bit confusing when we think about total nitrate intake because we've just reviewed the numbers that are nitrate concentrations in the forage itself, but then when we multiply those amounts by the pounds of hay or pounds of feed that that animal is eating, then there are some guidelines about total intake. And so I'm gonna provide these slides in this presentation later. We're not gonna go through the math again, but um, you'll see there that, again, there's nitrate, nitrogen, there's, there's nitrate itself. And these numbers are grams per 100 pounds of body weight. So if you were to sit down and do the math about how much that animal eats and then what the nitrate concentration actually means um, in relation to that, then you start to see what is the hazardous intake total intake level of these nitrates. So just for an example, and again, we're not gonna get into the nitty gritty of the math here, but um, if you know how, you know, roughly how many kilograms or pounds that your animal eats, um, and we can figure that on a percentage of body weight, then we can, you know, do some math to determine grams of nitrate that's in the diet, and then determine, okay, this, this cow is consuming you know, 14 grams of nitrate nitrogen there in the example, and that's a safe level compared to that table we just looked at. But if she's getting a high amount in her water and a high amount in her feed, then her intake, her total nitrate intake level is, is starting to get in that dangerous level. And so we wanna make sure that we're, you know, thinking about amounts and not just um, those parts per million that's in the, the one feed itself. So just to wrap up here with some feeding recommendations and then we'll open up for um, discussion, make sure that you're determining nitrate levels in any feed that you may uh, think could have high nitrates. So any forages that you've put up recently um, and maybe even that you, you know, are gonna purchase that could have been put up this time of year that have this um, drought condition. And then make sure that you limit any feed that you find questionable. So once you have determined the nitrate levels, um, decide how you're go going to limit that in the diet. If you are feeding something that has uh, higher nitrate levels, maybe dividing those daily feedings into smaller feedings. So, um, it, you know, if you were to feed 30 pounds of hay a day, 
then maybe we feed it in 10 pound increments. And that gets pretty labor intensive. That's not something that's easy to do. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's a challenge that we have to think about when it comes to our, our winter feeding situation. Uh, if you find feed, you know, that does have high nitrate levels um, and, you, and you decide to go ahead and feed it, start with just a small amount in the diet uh, for about a week. And if you don't see any negative effects, you don't see any you know, clear issues with it, then you can start to add a little bit more of that um, feed that has iron nitrate levels in it to the diet. So sort of like when we adapt animals to a high grain diet, we start with a low amount and we gradually step them up. Um, and so you wanna keep this adaptation if you're going to use forages that have a lot of nitrates, keep that adaptation gradual over time and then don't switch or skip to a forage that has no, you know, lower levels in it. So you don't want to skip a day of high nitrate feed and drop back down and then go back up. Um, if you're, you know, truly deciding to use this forage up, then do it gradually and go ahead and use it all the way until that inventory is, is complete. Uh, room and health is key. So making sure that our animals are healthy in general um, is going to be important, but specifically if we're feeding them something that can be challenging in the rumen environment, uh, feeding them a balanced ration, something that has enough energy and protein to utilize that nitrate efficiently. So I'll go back to the example of that non-protein nitrogen. Um, if we, you know, feed a lot of non-protein nitrogen, the animal may not be able to use it uh, because it becomes ammonia too quickly. But if we give them a starch or a quick energy source, um, then they're able to break down that, that nitrogen a little bit better. So same thing here. Maybe we decide to um, supplement with some grain and that grain can help to break down some of these nitrates a little bit more quickly so that they don't get into the system um, as that form of nitrite. There's also a, a note here to supplement with vitamin A. Um, nitrates in the blood or nitrates in the, the diet can start to interfere with vitamin A uptake. And so we want to make sure that we're providing a supplement. And a lot of times our mineral supplements have vitamin A in them um, just so that we're you know, not creating a, an additional problem here. And then Dr. Bates may have some more to talk about on the forage management side, but um, if you're going to cut uh, forage that has high nitrate levels, there's a certain way that you may want to harvest that, trying to avoid some of the lower parts of the plant or the stems. Um, and then if you're going to graze that area, avoid turning out hungry animals into a, a pasture that has been stunted by drought. So, um, you know, go ahead and fill them up with some dry hay first, and then, you know, maybe limit a very short amount of time for them to graze uh, a pasture that has high nitrate levels in it. So that gives us just a quick overview. I wanted to kind of introduce the, the issue that we're looking at here and then open up to, um, to questions. So you're welcome to use the chat or you're welcome to use the question and answer box. That question and answer box is a little bit easier because um, we can type answers while somebody else is answering another question. Um, but we would like to hear from you all, what kind of problems are you seeing and what questions do you have about how to manage this issue? And I'll give folks a, a minute there to start. Dr. Bates or Dr. Strickland, do y'all have anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, Katie, I'll just mention, you know, you've talked a lot about the nitrates, you know, inside the room. And the thing that's important to understand is, is nitrate is the form that the plant's going to store excess nitrogen in. So the reason that drought's important is because if that plant has a lot of nitrogen available in the soil. It takes up nitrogen, but it's not growing fast enough to produce carbohydrates through photosynthesis for it to make that protein. It's going to store that extra nitrogen in the nitrate form. And so that's the reason it's not, you know, it's not going to go away because that nitrate is stable. So it's a grazing or a hay problem. And uh, like she said, it's stored, higher levels are stored in the stem and the lower you get on, go on the stem, the higher the level is going to be. So if you have produced any hay, you know, this summer, particularly where you applied any sort of nitrogen, we would suggest that you run a nitrate test uh, through the soil plant pest center, a regular forage test is not going to give you nitrate level. So you need to make sure that you choose that you want a nitrate test as well as a 
a regular force test, and then you can make your decisions uh, based on that. Dr. Bates, could you mention also the, and I don't know the name for it, the like dropper test that agents have access to, the, the field test? Right, yeah. So we have, we call it just a quick test solution. It's got some sulfuric acid in it. And it's such that if, if there are nitrates in the, uh, in the plant, this solution is clear, but when you dribble it on there, there's a chemical reaction that, turn, uh, that occurs and it turns this kind of really dark, uh, purple to black type of color. <clears throat> it, is, it doesn't do anything as far as telling you the level. All it says is yes or no, there are nitrates present. So don't, don't try to judge how dark it turns means there's more or how fast it turns means there's more. Don't try to do that. It just, if you have some that you're worried about, you can get your agent to put this solution on there. If it turns colors, then you get a nitrate test run at the soil plant and pest center to determine the actual level. All right, thanks. We do have a question here in the Q&A. Um, how long does it typically take for end levels to drop after rain? Okay, I guess that would be for me. Uh, so, you know, anytime that uh, you get a rain and you start seeing the plant begin to grow, then it's going to be using some of that nitrate, that stored nitrate, to be able to grow and to make protein. How fast does it drop depends completely on how high the level was to start with. So, you know, you, you can't say, well, if it rains and it grows for a week, then, you know, it's going to be safe. Because if you're, you know, if you're starting with 12 or 15, you know, thousand parts per million of nitrate, it may take it a little bit longer than a week to be able to, to use all that nitrate up. So what we, you know, would suggest is that, um, you know, you, you would want to get a sample before you decide to graze or cut, even after about a week, and get a, get a test run. Make sure the lab knows you've got a sample, you know, coming, and then actually get it run so you know exactly what that nitrate level is. Yeah, and I think that kind of goes to this this next question here um, that popped up. It was, you know, does rain have the potential to reduce nitrate levels? And you touched on that. And I think it's sort of similar to that in siling situation. You know, it, it may reduce it a little bit, but we still want to test before we graze or feed just because we want to know what that level is. We don't want to take any chances of, you know, assuming that it may have dropped during uh, those conditions. All right. Uh, Dr. Bates, another question for you. Could you explain how nitrate levels get high initially in plants? Okay, yeah, so that's a good question. So the way it gets high is if uh, you apply nitrogen fertilizer and um, the plant ends up taking up more than it, it can use. So it's it can actually occur one of two ways. You can either put on too much nitrogen, of course, with fertilizer prices the way they're are this year. I doubt many people did that. Okay. But if you also, if you fertilize and then it, you, you're quickly followed with a drought so that that plant growth begins to slow down, just strictly from a lack of water, where you've got that nitrogen out there in the soil, the plant continues to take it up, but it doesn't have enough water to be able to photosynthesize efficiently. And it won't use that, those nitrates up. So it's usually a, a drought or, or nitrogen fertilization coupled with drought. The biggest place where, you know, you also have to really pay attention is if somebody's using some sort of an animal nor poultry litter or something like that for fertilizer. Um, there can be a lot of residual nitrogen that's breaking down through that, um, through that litter. So even if you applied some, you know, earlier in the spring and there were, there was good moisture conditions at that point, we get halfway through the summer and all of a sudden it gets dry. Well, some of that that poultry litter hasn't broken down, so there's still going to be some nitrogen release going on. And so you, you better make sure any place where you use any sort of a, a litter that you get those forages checked for uh, nitrate levels. All right, we've got another question here. And, and Dr. Strickland, don't worry, I'm not going to leave you out. I'm, I'm going to have a question for you in a minute. But 
Um, another question that popped up, will unfertilized pasture still present a problem during drought conditions? Okay, usually not with nitrates, no. If they haven't been fertilized, then there's not going to be a whole lot of nitrogen um, in the soil. Uh, and so it, it should not be a problem. Um, it's, it's, but you, you have to make sure that, you know, you don't have, um, you haven't used any poultry litter or any sort of a manure or anything like that. But usually that nitrogen has got to come from somewhere. And usually nitrogen that's applied, it's only going to hang around, yeah, 45 to maybe 60 days. So if it was something that you fertilized during the spring, you know, in that March to early April period, if the droughts aren't coming until, you know, July, then usually you're pretty safe from that standpoint. All right, while we wait for some more questions to come in, um, Dr. Strickland, I, I may have, you know, spoken out of turn when I said that we typically don't see the symptoms before we see uh, dead animals, but I'm not sure if that's true. So, can you tell us a little bit about calls that you get that, you know, where you try to determine if nitrate was the cause and how you go about that? Well, um, I think you said it correctly. Uh, you find dead animals. That's usually the call I get. Uh, we found several animals dead in one spot. What do you think happened? And I mean, I literally got a call this afternoon about, uh, the guy said he had lost five cows the last five days. And uh, of course, I, I'm, I'm racking my brain on everything that can cause sudden death in cattle. And of course, nitrate toxicity is one of them. <clears throat> it can also happen in the water as well. I know we're focusing on forage, uh, but it can happen in the water as well. Uh, and he said there was a, he had, some water sources that uh, were, were okay by me. One of them was a well, one of them was a creek, uh, but he did say there was one spot and y'all explain this one to me why cows will do this, but they'll do it. They got a clean watering source right over yonder, but they'll find this old mud puddle uh, that uh, collects some water, usually in a low spot, usually where it runs down off a hillside or something, especially where it's been fertilized or where organic material just builds up and it runs down into this little low area and then they want to drink out of it. And uh, I think he did say there were a couple of calves that were literally, he said they're almost on top of each other, um, not very far from this watering hole or he might even sit in the watering hole. So uh, water, water can do it, but usually, usually unless you're just uh, living with your cows, um, Dead animals will be the first thing that you find. Something that you can do to kind of just a real quick um, assessment of what may have caused it. Look at their mucous membranes, their gums right up above their teeth or around their teeth or just crack their mouth open. Uh, the gums will be chocolate colored, a brown chocolate colored. Uh, as Dr. Mason was mentioning, uh, so very well a while ago with uh, what causes the problem with well, asphyxiation that the, ox the blood is not oxygenated and it turns this brown color and, it, and if it something else you can do uh, and it's it is almost telltale because I've done it too uh, animals that I find dead you can uh, uh, make a slice over the jugular and the blood that comes out will look like chocolate milk it'll have a dark brown color to it as well. Now, of course, after an animal dies, that blood uh, doesn't stay red like it was, uh, but still it'll look chocolate in color. So uh, unless you're just flat out paying attention to these cows, usually sudden death is what you find, but you may find an animal staggering around acting drunk. Um, but, but this nitrate acts pretty fast. Hey, Luke, can I ask you a question? Sure. So let's say that, uh, you know, I go out, I see three or four cows dead. I suspect nitrates because I'm looking at their gums. Gums are black. I got two or three or whatever other cows that are look like they're kind of struggling a little bit. And, and when I look at their gums, it is the, you know, the brown color. Right. I'm, I'm worried about losing them. I'm not sure if I got it. I mean, I'll call my vet. 
but I'm not sure how fast my vet's going to be there. Is there anything that you can do between yeah, really when wish, you find it and yeah. when the vet gets there? Yeah, I really wish I could tell you there was something uh, that you could do. Methylene blue is usually the treatment for this stuff. Uh, I don't know that I've ever seen it myself or to even buy it or to even purchase it. So, um, yeah, uh, keep the cow calm as possible. Try not to stress the cow. Stress will drive it even further uh, into the clinical signs of it or maybe even uh, speed up death. So the only thing you can do is just try to keep the cow chill as possible. And I know that may be difficult. Yeah, that was a good question. Um, we've got another one here that I, I hadn't thought about. Uh, Dr. Bates, can legumes like cow peas add the nitrate load into like a Sudan um, Sudex grass mix? Okay. Um, well, uh, if, if you haven't fertilized with nitrogen, I wouldn't be terribly concerned, you know, about if you're dependent on the cow peas for the nitrogen, uh, considering them to produce enough nitrogen to really cause this problem, okay? Because usually the, the legumes that we use during the summertime, cow peas, annual espadies, and some of that kind of stuff, they, they don't produce a huge amount of nitrogen. Mm -hmm. So usually I, I wouldn't expect that to be a problem. However, nitrate toxicity is, is deadly enough, if you have it, that I would say if you suspect it at all, the best thing you can do is to clip some samples, get, get it run to know what the nitrate level is because you know there, there can always potentially be scenarios um, where you know, let's just say that you, you had a bunch of wheat and crimson clover and vetch and everything in the spring, and you had a lot of crimson clover in there. And so not only do you have the, the cowpea producing the nitrogen, but maybe you also have the breakdown of some of the, 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 the crimson clover roots and everything. And so you may end up with more nitrogen than what you expect. So I, I would just say if there's any doubt whatsoever, take a sample, get it run, let's know for sure. Could you follow that up, um, Dr. Bates, with is there a different procedure or anything special you need to do taking a, a nitrate or a sample for nitrate versus just like a regular hay test? Uh, as far as like sample, making sure the sample's integrity is okay throughout the process. Okay, well, so if, it, if it's already bailed up and it's in a the bale, then just the same way you sample for a, they take a regular forage test, the same thing for nitrates. If it's a, a, a green standing plant in the field, you know, what you want to do is, is cut, um, you know, let's just say, okay, we're talking about Sudex and it's out there and you're worried about, is there nitrate levels? You know, we'll go out there and cut some of the plants and cut them at about a six to eight inch height, cut the entire plant, cut, you know, three, four or five of them in different spots around the field. And then um, just cut those into, you know, smaller kind of maybe, you know, inch sections, two inch sections, just something smaller and send that whole sample in. And then when they get to the lab, what they'll do is they'll grind them or they'll dry them, grind them, run the sample. And they can usually get that done in, you know, just a day or so. They, they do have to dry the samples, but clip the whole sample, cut it into smaller sections, send that to the lab. I have a, a question that I got um, from an agent that I wasn't sure about that deals with silo gases and the ensiling process. So I don't know if, if you or even uh, Dr. Strickland with his dairy experience uh, can speak to this, but the question was about whether silo gases, which would accumulate in a silo or in a pit, would be a problem with um, baleage. So when you unwrap that bale, uh, is there any you know problem with that, any gas that might come out of that? Uh, okay, so there, there's going to be gases that, um, you know, are made just during the fermentation process, but I, I wouldn't expect it to be an issue because, um, you know, what, what you end up with is when you're opening up haylage, you're in a pretty open area out there where these, you know, all this, these sausage tubes are with the haylage. So 
I wouldn't be worried about the silo gases causing problems in that situation at all. Usually it's in a silo and it usually is an upright silo where those gases are a little bit heavier and they collect down there and, and then you got issues that come with that. Okay. Well, that's what I told them. So I'm glad to hear that answer. <laughs> Um, another question came in here, and I, I may need some clarification here, Greg. Can cattle traffic grazing warm season grasses cause a problem, particularly if we are intensive or mob grazing? So I'm, I'm wondering if you mean a heavy manure load, stre stressing, okay, just causing stress on the plants um, to make them accumulate more nitrogen. Okay. I mean, yeah, sure it could. You know, anything that slows the plant's growth down, um, you know, could cause nitrates to accumulate because the plants aren't utilizing the nitrogen because they're not growing very fast. Um, but, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, if I have an actively growing field, you know, and I'm, I'm, that I'm grazing, if it's, if it's actively growing, Unless I've loaded it with nitrogen, you don't expect there to be nitrate issues. Uh, so if it's an area that's kind of, I don't know, inside a gate or, or around a water trough and it's traffic pretty heavy, I mean, it's, it's possible, but it usually is going to have to be coupled with a drought, I would say. I mean, unless it's right inside the gate where the fertilizer spreader, you know, and they turned it on and accidentally put a whole bunch in a in a corner or something like that, I, I wouldn't necessarily be worried about it. Is there um, a cost associated with that field test? And then do you know the price off the top of your head for a nitrate test on forage sample? Okay, so for the quick test, <laughs> no, I don't think there's not really... A cost. It's just a matter of contacting your agent and trying to get that run. Uh, the nitrate test. Gosh, I should have checked that for this. I'm I'm wanting to say it's like ten or twelve bucks is what it costs to get that run. And while we're talking, I'll just look that up real quick. So let's go on to the next question. Yeah. Does anybody else have have any questions for us? These have been really good. Ten dollars. Ronnie beat you to it. He's been he's been testing some samples this <laughs> this okay. last month or so. Thanks, Ronnie. Anybody else have anything? This has been good discussion, and hopefully, what um, what some folks needed for some clarification. I even, as I was putting this presentation together, it helped me to get my head wrapped around some of those numbers and. Uh, specifically thinking about that threshold that we're comfortable saying, you know, go for it versus we need to think about it a little bit better and, you know, decide if we're willing to to try to limit feed or or really control that diet, which can be, again, pretty labor intensive. So give folks just another minute or two to see if there's any more questions that pop up. Dr. Bates or Dr. Strickland, do y'all have any uh, last comments? Hang on, I'll read this question real quick. Two questions. Um, does the application of lime have any effect, good or bad, on nitrogen toxicity? Uh, practically, no. You know, I mean, if it raises your pH, plant's going to grow better, you know, that kind of thing. But from a practical standpoint, no, the lime won't have any impact on it. All right. Um, will the dropper test work on dry hay? Yes. Yes, it will. Okay. Ronnie said he hadn't had a lot of luck. So um, could that be a, an old solution problem or? Well, it could be that, but usually if it's old solution, it's the solution itself is kind of starting to get a color. So you kind of know when the solution is old. It could also be you know, the fact that it depends on what the sample is, you know, because the levels are higher in the stems. And it's, a, you know, if you take a, a core um, and you have this kind of ground up hay, you may not be getting the solution exactly on the right spots. 
But no, I mean, it, it detects just nitrates and it doesn't, whether it's a dry hay or a wet forage, it, it works equally on either one of them. Mm -hmm. I tend to think it works better on a wet forage just because you can cut the stem and dribble it right on that stem. All right. And then somebody asked, for the um the contact info for forage testing i'm going to put the link to the soil plant and pest center in the chat box but also um reach out to your your county agent they can get you know they can help you take a sample um and they can also you know get you the information on how to do that if it, you know if you want to do it yourself i think this goes to everybody um but it says hosts and panelists so Okay. Well, it's very easy. Just Google Soil Plant and Pest Center because I yeah. just did that. That's the first thing that comes up. It's just a UT Soil Plant and Pest Center. And when you go to that, then there's going to be a section that if you look underneath it, you look under forage. There's a button that says forage and you go from there with it. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I guess, Katie, the last thing I would say is just to remember that forage does not break down in the hay. So just cause you cut it this summer and you kind of, maybe you forget about it and then you store it, you feed it this winter and all of a sudden cows could die. You know, you, you have to make sure that anything that you produce this summer, particularly during the drought, go ahead and get it tested. Mm -hmm. Everybody's gonna be testing their hay anyway. So they'll put nitrates on there too, right? There you go. All right, any other last minute questions? I asked for those and like three popped up at the same time. So we'll give folks just another minute here. All right, I'm not seeing anything. Um, Dr. Bates or Dr. Strickland, do you have any last comments? I know you just said that, you know, making sure you get your hay tested um, even in the winter for those nitrates. And um, obviously, you know, reach out to your county agent. If you have questions about testing, they can certainly help you do that. Reach out to any of us um, and we'd be happy to, to answer questions too. I will ask real quick, because uh, I don't know this answer myself because it seemed like I questioned one time about water testing. Does anybody know where we can get water tested? I'm asking that question for myself because I don't know. Yeah, I, I thank seen, you. I, I asked one time at, I can't, I can't remember where it was, and they sent me to the county, and then the county said, no, we don't test it. You got to go somewhere else. Uh, does anybody know a, a, a source? Uh, thank you for asking that, because I meant to ask that earlier, and I'd forgotten. So, um, Dr. Bates, you might correct me if I'm wrong, but we, so we don't test for, we don't test water. I think that Tennessee Tech is kind of the main place that I've told people to send it. Um, do you have any other recommendations, Dr. Bates? Okay, I should have, again, maybe prepared for that, but I thought if it's for livestock, doesn't the Department of Agriculture test that? Seemed like they, that's who sent me to the county, I think. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think at, at one point back years ago, I mean, this may be 15 years ago, but I think that I had some samples tested for nitrates through the Department of Agriculture. And so we may have to uh, try to hunt that up and... Um, well, I mean, I know some of some other places, Oklahoma State does, I'm pretty sure Michigan State does, but I, I just was curious about anything close by. John Goddard, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say that John Goddard said microback labs in Maryville, so that must be a private lab here um, in Maryville, and, and I have talked to Robert about this um, at the Soul Plant and Pest Center because I'm actually putting together a water quality publication right now um, to, to put out. And we wondered about that. If, if the Sultan and Pest Center had any interest or, you know, capability to start testing livestock water, 
I do think that the Department of Ag can test like well water. I don't know if that runs a nitrate test, but I don't know if they specifically test like pond water too. Um, so we'll have to, to get some more information about that. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Well, it looks like that's all the questions. I don't see anything else coming in. I really appreciate um, Dr. Strickland and Dr. Bates y'all's you know, time tonight and you're answering questions and appreciate everybody for being on and being interactive. Um, we'll certainly get this posted since it is a, a timely topic. We'll get it on to YouTube so that folks can, um, can go back and watch if they need to. So with that, I uh, hope you all have a, a good evening. If you're on the virtual monthly series, we'll see you in September. And I believe that is September 6th, which is the day after Labor Day. It'll be on a Tuesday night um, in September. So we'll look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks. <laughs>